Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I am James Butt in Washington. Today is Wednesday, January 4th, and here are some of the stories we are covering. A South Sudan rebel leader blames President Kiir for stalemate in peace implementation. The suspension of the talks by Salfa Kiir is another strategy for him and his government to continue violence against the opposition and the people of South Sudan. Somalia president's declaration on security attracts mixed reactions. Gambia charges two civilians and a police officer in connection with the alleged coup plot. Lesotho police arrest four suspects for alleged human trafficking. Experts fault Malawi government for closing schools over cholera outbreak. The playing field is not level. It is schools in Blanta and Dirongwe that have been affected. So Blanta and Dirongwe students will be disadvantaged in terms of time for them to cover their syllabuses. And Somalia is to hire 3,000 teachers after quadrupling education budget. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. In South Sudan, the leader of the Rebel National Salvation Front says the decision by President Salva Kiir to suspend peace talks with the so-called hold-out rebel groups is yet another strategy to continue violence against the opposition and the citizens of South Sudan. President Kiir announced this week that he was suspending talks because the groups continue to carry out activities that destabilize the country. General Thomas Cirillo says he and the other so-called peace holdouts want to address the root causes of the conflict in South Sudan because they are tired of seeing South Sudanese fight among themselves and kill each other. General Cirillo tells me that it was President Salva Kiir and his delegation who withdrew from the talks in 2020, saying they were going to consult with leadership. The suspension of the talks by Salva Kiir is another strategy for him and his government to continue violence against the opposition and the people of South Sudan. The truth is that his delegation withdrew from the talks in 2020, saying they're going to Juba for consultation with their leadership. And up to now, they did not come back, and we are still waiting for them for us to continue the negotiation in order to address the root causes of the conflict and achieve sustainable peace in the country. President Sabakia said that he was suspending the talks because you, your group, and others have uh, continued to carry out activities, according to him, that uh, destabilized uh, South Sudan. Are you engaged in activities that destabilize South Sudan? This is a complete lie by Salfakir. Salfakir is the one waging war against the opposition. He's the one causing all this violence in the country. Recently, when he was addressing his forces going to Congo, Salfakir declared war against the opposition. So how come that he accused, he's accusing now the opposition that he's the one causing the violence in the country? No, Salfakir is the one destroying the country, he's the one dis- causing all these wars in the country. So this is 2023, and uh, General, I'd like for you to tell me um, what is your message in terms of peace in South Sudan, particularly implementation of the agreement? My message to the people of South Sudan is that there is no peace in the country. Sadly, our country is disintegrating. Our country is collapsing. There is now different types of wars all over the country. The flawed Air Access Agreement has failed completely, and it did not achieve peace for our people. This year, 2023, is going to be a defining year for our people to stand up and determine their future. Therefore, National Salvation Front and the like-minded groups in the National Consensus Forum that are all the oppositions outside the country, civil society, women and youth groups, and faith-based groups, inviting the people of South Sudan to the Roundtable Conference for us to address the root causes of the conflict and achieve sustainable peace uh, for our people. General, what do you make of the surge in violence, particularly communal violence in South Sudan? I'm talking about what has been taking place in places like uh, Jonglia, Pibo area, and other regions of the country. How can this uh, be stopped? The community violence in the country is the making of the regime. The regime is the one pitting our communities against each other. The regime, in fact, is the one sponsoring all these wars so that our people don't attend to what they're doing in the country, in terms of them failing the country, in terms of them looting their resources and killing them and doing everything against the people of South Sudan. Therefore, the only way is for us as South Sudanese to come together in the roundtable conference in order for us to address the root causes of the conflict, including the causes of this community violence, so that we resolve them and achieve peace for our people. 
I just read this week, President Salva Kiir saying that he has forgiven his deputy president, Riyak Meshaw. What do you make of that? And do you think uh, that sends a message also to you and the others in terms of how to bring about peace? First of all, James, I cannot speak for Riyak Meshaw or others. But let me say this. Salva Kiir is the one to seek forgiveness from the people of South Sudan from all the crimes that he has been committing with his government against our people and the country. The only way for Salva Kiir is to redeem himself by stopping all this violence against our people, come to the roundtable conference so that all of us address the root causes of the conflict, resolve them, and achieve sustainable peace for our people. That was General Thomas Cirillo Suwaka, leader of the Rebel National Salvation Front of South Sudan. Somalia's President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, in his New Year's Day speech on Sunday, declared the country will eliminate al shabaab Islamist militant this year. Mohammed's all-out war against the group, declared last year, has succeeded in pushing the militants out of some areas under their control. The President also said Somalia would also take over security operations from African Union peacekeepers in Somalia by the end of 2024. Mohammed Sheikh Noah reports from Mogadishu. The Somali National Army's recent success against Al-Shabaab, achieved with the help of allied local militia in central Somalia, has attracted regional and international attention due to its homegrown approach in fighting terrorism. President Mahmoud has been trying to rally Somalis behind the government, and in his speech he referred to Al-Shabaab as Khawarij, a term referring to a person who deviates from the path of Islam. Mahmoud said that Somalis have taken a stand against Khawarij, regardless of where they live. This battle is in progress and is nearing completion. He said, it is my hope that Somalia will be prosperous and peaceful in 2023. Ahmed Abdesalam, former deputy prime minister and current director of Horn Center, a Somali-based research and policy center, applauded the president's promise for the government to take over all security duties from African Union peacekeepers. I think uh, uh, Abdeslam said the president's annual address should be welcomed as security is the country's greatest concern. He said it was great for the president to provide a timeline for when he will take responsibility for security. However, Abdullahi Gafu a Mogadishu-based political analyst is skeptical about Mahmoud's pledges. Uh, Gafu says that after listening to the speech given by the president, he found there was no difference between this speech and the previous speeches that had been given by the previous presidents, in that they all stated they would plan to assume responsibility for security from the African Union. He says that Therefore, nothing has changed. Gafu says that the withdrawal of African Union forces is complicated by the fact that Somalia is still under a UN army's embargo, an obstacle that limits the capacity of Somalia's security forces. AU peacekeeping forces have been serving in Somalia since 2007 and have been crucial in protecting government strongholds. Mohamed Sheikh Noor for VOA, Mogadishu. Somalia. The Gambian government says it has charged two civilians and a police officer with concealment of treason and felony conspiracy in connection with the alleged plot to overthrow the administration of President Adam Ambaro. The government announced last week that it had foiled an attempted coup. Gambian government spokesperson Ibrahim Sankare tells me Three people have been remanded at the state central prison pending trial. He also says President Barrow has urged Gambians to believe in the democratic process and to reject military coups. Three days ago, two civilians and a police officer in the rank of a sub-inspector who is uh, by profession a police investigation officer were arrested after the investigative panel that was set up in the wake of the foil coup directly linked them with uh, the ongoing investigation about the coup saga. So subsequent to their arrest this afternoon at the Banjul Magistrate's Court, all three appeared before a magistrate and they were charged with concealment of treason and felony conspiracy to commit treason. So they, so they subsequently remanded and demand to state central prisons in Banjo. Now, what happens now? When do you expect for them to go to court? Well, if we go in by the timeline of the investigative panel, 
it has been given a month to submit its report. And subsequently, based on the recommendations and the findings of the Commission you know, of Inquiry into this alleged coup plot, the people found wanting would face the due process of the law. The people found to be free would be let go. Based on that time frame, I would suggest or I would argue that uh, in a very short period, we will begin to see people appear in court. What we witnessed this afternoon is just the beginning of that process. That three people, two civilians and a police officer, we are quickly arraigned before a magistrate's court and in the charge. And that is consistent with the Constitution. But treason being what it is, is not a bailable offence. The only thing is to have them remanded. And they were remanded at the mile two state prisons this afternoon. Has President uh, Barrow said anything at all uh, about this alleged attempted coup? Has he made any comment about this? Yes, he did. He gave a very measured uh, speech, New Year's speech. And then he admonished Gambians that the democratic process was very free and fair and very transparent. And if Gambians wanted to buy a political office, they are free to apply as candidates in presidential elections or parliamentary elections. The Gambians have endured enormous hardship in the 22 years of dictatorship that was born out of a military coup. The Gambians should not sit and tired of coups, and the Gambians should come together and work as a nation. And he also advised people who live along the border areas to cooperate with the security forces to make sure that the safety and security of this country is kept. So uh, I was just reading, did President Barrow appoint a new security advisor and does he have anything to do with the alleged attempted coup? In times like these, people can, can, can make those kind of arguments. However, the appointment of a uh, Abubakar Suleiman Jen as new security advisor, it actually came way before the coup was announced, uh, maybe some, some months before. He is a guy, he's a career police officer who served the United Nations in New York, in Palestine, in Israel, in Liberia, in Somalia, and earlier home here in the Gambia, he was a police administrator in the First Republic on the Sadara Karabajor. He, he brings to bear a, a lot of experience, and we need his expertise and, and experience and wisdom given that the Gambia is poised to change the security infrastructure, to, to reform the security sector. After 22 years of Ayajami's uh, rule, you know, the, the army need, needs a lot of fixing to be done. And, and with his expertise and, and guidance, I think President Barrow is poised to have, you know, a, a new system of military administration in the Gambia. Thank you so much again. It's very nice to speak with you. Happy New Year. Thank you. you Ibrahim Sankare is the Gambian government spokesperson. He was speaking with me from the capital, Banjo. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I am James Barty in Washington. Today is Wednesday, January 4th. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Advocates for education and health care in Malawi are criticizing the government's decision to close the schools in two cities to try to contain a cholera outbreak. The bacterial disease spread by dirty water has infected more than 18,000 people in Malawi and killed more than 600 since March. Lamek Masina reports from Blantyre. The Presidential Task Force on Coronavirus and Cholera says in a statement Monday that suspension is applied to all primary and secondary schools in the capital Lilongwe and commercial hub Blanta. Kumbize Kandodo Chiponda is the co-chairperson for the task force. Chiponda, who is also Malawi's Minister of Health, told a press conference Tuesday the decision is a result of continuing increase in the number of cholera cases in these two hardest hit cities. As of Monday, the disease had killed more than 620 people out of 18,222 cases since the outbreak in March. She says in the last seven days, we have recorded 2,773 with 137 deaths. Out of these figures, Blanta alone recorded 792 cases with 36 deaths, while Lilongwe recorded 536 cases with 36 deaths. She says our fear was what will happen if we allow learners to return to school. 
Malawian Education and Health Rights Campaigners say the timing of the suspension was wrong. Hastings Morocco is the trustee of the Private Schools Association of Malawi. He told a press conference Monday that there is no logic in suspending learning in only two out of 28 affected districts. The playing field is not level. It is schools in Blanta and Lirongwe that have been affected. While our students are not learning, students everywhere else in the country are learning. And yet these students <coughs> will sit for exactly the same exams exactly at the same time. So Blanta and Lirongwe students will be disadvantaged in terms of time for them to cover their syllabuses. Morocco says there is also no scientific evidence that cholera spreads more in schools than in homes. Cholera is an acute diarrheal infection caused by ingesting food or water contaminated with bacteria. The disease affects both children and adults and if untreated can kill within hours. Agnes Nyalonje is Minister of Education in Malawi. She says the move is to protect the lives of the learners in these two cholera hotspot districts. The issue is a balance between protection of life and uh, continuity of learning. We have information that shows that currently across all schools we are short of 1,262 boreholes or water supply in schools that many schools need water supply and for schools we're saying personal hygiene and school hygiene have to go hand in hand nyalonje said her ministry has put measures in place to allow students in the closed schools to take lessons through distance learning as was the case when the schools shut down for the covid 19 pandemic lamik masina for viewer news blanta malawi Lesotho police say four suspects are in jail awaiting trial following their arrest for alleged human trafficking. Olomo Molibile is Lesotho's police commissioner. He says the victims are usually children from poor families. He tells me that police are advising parents and the public to beware of individuals who act as if they are helping the needy, but who may be traffickers. Yes, it happened that uh, here in Maseru, a girl aged 15 years went missing. The parents were looking around in the village, but they couldn't find her. But they were informed that there was a vehicle, a couple of vehicles, three number, which were around, and they were, those uh, vehicles were strange in that village. And uh, they suspected when they went around the village that uh, the girl was missing, and they went to the police to report the matter. And uh, the police revealed in their investigation that uh, uh, who the driver, which vehicle was around there, and uh, the information revealed that one of those vehicles had taken uh, the, the girl and another girl into the Republic of South Africa from the city. So the investigation revealed uh, uh, the destination. The driver was arrested and the girls were, uh, were rescued and taken back to the city. How prominent is this issue of trafficking? Is this something that is just a one-time thing, or is it always there for Lesotho? It is there, and uh, even in this particular uh, matter, uh, the gentleman seems to be uh, taking uh, many girls into South Africa, and who are targeting another one who is eight to nine years since uh, he has been arrested. Uh, the girl is safe now. He has other two who are already in South Africa. Even this one who is assisting him, he uh, is an accomplice in this matter, who has been arrested, uh, was also uh, in the past a victim of him. So this individual is a uh, Lesotho citizen, and is that correct? In actual sense, he is a South African, but uh, he was brought up here in Lesotho, and uh, after completion of his uh, university, uh, he migrated to South Africa, which is his, uh, uh, he's a citizen of South Africa, in fact. So is this uh, sex trafficking or, I mean, what other type of trafficking problems do you have? Yes, um, some of the, the issues like this one uh, involve sexual exploitation, while others are uh, used as sort of slaves uh, in their farms in South Africa. Others are used uh, for trafficking drugs. Yeah, these are the, the most uh, factors that uh, people are involved in when they are trafficked. You said that the victims are usually children who come from poor families. What advice do you want to give to 
parents in terms of what they should look up for for this kind of behavior? Yes, uh, particularly for the children, uh, what we are trying to do, we try to show them that uh, in anything that uh, they are invited because they are lured into believing that they are scholarships, they are uh, good life that we, they will enjoy when they are taken. They have to uh, share this information with their parents or their guardian so that uh, that could be uh, diffused uh, with assistance of the police. So with the parents, we try to uh, encourage them to ensure that the young children are not left alone. They are uh, those who are with them uh, throughout to take care of them. That would be the only way that uh, uh, children could not be manipulated. Thank you so much again, sir. It's a pleasure speaking with you. Happy New Year again. Thanks very much, sir. And uh, same to you. And uh, let's all enjoy it with you. That was Holomo Molibile, Lesotho's police commissioner. You are speaking with me from the capital, Maseru. Somalia's President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed announced on Sunday that the country will hire a record 3,000 new teachers to try to bridge a wide education gap. The move follows a four-fold increase in the Somali Ministry of Education's budget for 2023. But critics note funding for education is still poor and that security and poverty have pushed the majority of Somali children out of school. Ahmed Mohammed reports from Mogadishu. The New Year's Day budget announcement by President Mohamud marked one of Somalia's most ambitious education campaign in years. Mohamud said Somalia this year will hire 3,000 more teachers to address a shortage that has hindered learning. In an interview with VOA, Somalia's Ministry of Education Director General Mohamed Hassan says the teachers are sorely needed. And <laughs> He says 1,000 teachers are on the government payroll in Mogadishu and all the regional states combined for the past five years. Hassan says the ministry's latest report shows only a quarter of school age children have access to education. Hassan says the new teachers will be recruited with priority given to areas of Somalia that have little access to education. He says special opportunities will be given to districts where there are very few school students and also to areas where the Khawarij were dislodged. Khawarij, which loosely translates those who deviate from the Islamic faith, is the term Somali authorities use to refer the Islamist militant group as Shabab. Mahmoud last year declared all-out war on the Islamists and federal troops and their backers have since made gains in taking back territory that was under the group's control. A shabab run areas of Somalia are locked out of Somalia's formal education as the group imposes a curriculum based on a harsh interpretation of Islam. President Mahmoud, in his New Year's Day speech, vowed to eliminate the militants in 2023. The president last week quadrupled Somalia's education budget this year to 34 million U.S. dollars. While it is the highest education budget in years, critics say it is still far from the funding needed to instruct the country's youth. Suad Abdullah is the founder of the Somali Institute of Special Educational Needs and Disability. She tells VOA that poor funding is the main reason why most Somali children are failing to attend school. Abdullah says close to 70% of children are not in school because of several factors. The first one is the lack of funding, she says, as the large percentage of Somalis are living on less than a dollar per day while most schools in the country are private. Access to education in Somalia remains among the lowest in the world. The UN Children's Fund, UNICEF, says 3 million Somali children are out of school. Ahmed Mohamed for VOA News, Mogadishu, Somalia. And that's it for this Wednesday, January 4th edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for coming aboard with us this morning. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are also on YouTube, where you can watch our TV shows, Africa 54, Straight Talk Africa, and Red Carpet. On behalf of the Daybreak Africa crew, I am James Barty in Washington, wishing that you will have a wonderful day. Thank you.